and welcome to The Contrarians, where we're right and you're wrong. Before we get to the show, let's get the pleasantries out of the way. First of all, our website. If you want more information about our little podcast, go to wearethecontrarians.com. That's where you'll find links to our old episodes, to our Patreon channel, and to our awesome Contrarians merch. You can show your support by buying a Contrarians mug or a pillow. I like the laptop bags myself. Second of all, if you enjoy the show, tell your friends. Or even go a step further and leave us a five-star review on whatever platform you use to listen to your podcasts. Finally, if you want to reach out directly to us, that's what social media is for. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at Contrarian Prime, or check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Contrarian Prime. Julio runs our official Twitter account at Contrarian Prime, but if you want to give me a piece of your mind or just want to banter about pro wrestling, you can follow me at Contrarian Alex. That's it. That's our intro. Now, time for the show. This is our And we are recording for Contrarians Corner for The Guard. Hello, welcome back to The Contrarians, where we're right and you're wrong. My name is Alex, joined as always by my friend and cohort, my co-pilot down the, I always say path, but it's really just a never-ending road. It's a, <laughs> it's a multiverse, if you will. The, the <laughs> multiverse of the contrary, Julio Oliveira. Julio, how are you doing on this Monday evening? Um, a little sad that I have to go back to work tomorrow, but if I have to if I have to finish this holiday by talking to you about this movie, well, there are worse ways of uh, of ending it. Yeah, we're here today to discuss The Guard. This is a patron demand. Julio, who's bringing this across our desk? Katie and OT. Beloved patrons Katie and OT, who have given us before such movies as Whiplash and Daddy Daycare, uh, <laughs> wildly opposite. Yeah, I was about the, to say, just the a buckshot approach here. Got to respect it. Yeah, I wonder if they're alternating. You know, Whiplash was fresh, Daddy Daycare was rotten, this one is fresh again. Who knows what they'll bring next time. Is there a reasoning given as to why we're watching this or why we watch this? No, no. They've, they've been pretty, pretty quiet about any sort of... Uh, rationale behind this i'm assuming they like it but who knows maybe i because actually i remember they didn't like whiplash and so they submitted it Mm -hmm. because they wanted to enjoy us taking it down uh during the corner so maybe they also don't like the guard they have they have problems with don Cheadle trying to be funny you need don Cheadle serious that's all all they want is they need um what was that movie that came out like 2008 with him that was just more serious than a fucking heart attack Hotel Rwanda? Like, no, well, that one, too. Um, <laughs> it was some movie where he was the star of it that was like an um, espionage government thriller type thing. Um, I don't know. It'll probably come to me at some point during this, and I'll shout it out. Uh, I'll tell you who liked the guard, the gad, is... Uh, <laughs> My, I try to do like an Irish accent, but it just comes across as a fucking Boston, some fat guy from Boston. Yes. <laughs> it's the gad. Yeah, I can't do it. Uh, I'll tell you who liked it, though. Out of the 139 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, this baby sits at 94% certified fresh. So the critics ate it up back in 2011. The unlikely pairing of Don Cheadle and Brendan Gleeson was enough to get the critics out this i didn't realize that brendan gleason actually got nominated for a golden globe for this movie well i mean oscars are nothing (laughs) that's nice on the day of the nominations for the golden globes but honestly the fact that you don't remember (laughs) that should say it all it's not that i don't remember julio it's that i didn't know there's a big difference (laughs) oh (laughs) uh he was up against Joseph Gordon-Levitt for 50-50, Ryan Gosling for Crazy Stupid Love, so this thing has already lost all credibility, Uh, (laughs) Owen Wilson for Midnight in Paris, and of course, the eventual winner, Julio, it was 2012. Uh, Do you remember who dominated the... uh, Man, you always do this to me. I feel like I should should study nominations and winners before the recording. It would not surprise me, or it doesn't surprise me that you don't remember, because Homeboy has done nothing since, and that would be... Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> it's the artist. It's uh, Sean Dujardin. <laughs> Correct, yeah. <laughs> During this whole award season, that excuse me, that whole award season, the coolest thing he did was make a random cameo on SNL as his character from the artist so he didn't have any lines. And 
uh, the reception was tepid to say the least. It was like three <laughs> people, like, woo! Who is this guy? <laughs> yeah. Who's this handsome dude who's dancing out here? So, Brennan Gleason and uh, Don Cheadle, as we mentioned, Helm the Guard, as I mentioned, a 2011 release, premiered on January 20th at the Sundance Film Festival of 2011, and that was released uh, on July 7th of 2011 in Ireland. Um, looks like its release was fairly limited here. It was released wide in Ireland and the United Kingdom, which, of course, makes sense. Uh, but an interesting movie. And it is a movie from the mid 2000s that features, you know, British crime. So you can bet your fucking ass that Mark Strong is in there as one of the hired <laughs> guns. Uh, were you disappointed, Alex, that Don Cheadle is not playing an Irishman? No, no. I I would have felt so bad for Don Cheadle if they're like, all right, we need you to be Brad Pitt and Snatch. <laughs> You're you're selling Cheeto short. I would love to if the original script that John Michael uh, McDonough wrote uh, had it written that way and Don Cheadle showed up. He's like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> no, I know Don Cheadle's hilarious. Um, he's very funny in the Oceans movies. And I, I know that he is a really talented actor, but I just didn't And he puts that. on an accent. Isn't he British in the Oceans movies? Uh, maybe it's, uh, it's been 15 years since I've seen either, any of those. So <laughs> you tell me brother. I think so. And I think that from a British accent to an Irish accent, I mean, that's not that much of a stretch. Let's see, is that accurate? I just guess that. Yeah. The oceans 13 came out. The last one was in 2007. So literal 15 years, whatever the case, John Michael McDonough, Writer and director, also in his filmography, The Second Death from 2000, Ned Kelly from 2003, and since The Guard, Cavalry, War on Everyone, and The Forgiven. He uh, has his actors that he likes working with. This wouldn't be the last time he worked with Brandon Gleason uh, and some of the others uh, throughout this uh, featured in this movie. No more Cheadle, though. No, you know, Don Cheadle. It's like I always say, the rattlesnake venom thing. You just need it once in your filmography, and then you're set. <laughs> then you got to share. Mm -hmm. You got to share the wealth with other filmmakers. You can't, yeah, you can't bogard Don Cheadle. <laughs> He's not like, you know, the roster that Rob Zombie keeps on lock that makes, he makes him sign NDAs, and they can't do anything else with their time. Uh, you got to you gotta have Cheadle. You got to share him with the world. All right, so Julio going into the... Uh, European style of uh, action and comedy for this one. And before we jump into it, I want to go ahead and thank KT and OT, our patrons who, again, demanded this and we bring it to you because that's what we do for our patrons. Uh, if you're a returning listener, thank you. If you're a first time listener, great. Uh, to our returning listeners and our patrons, give us just a moment here while we explain what it is we do to any and all potential first timers out there. Here on The Contrarians, we like to rage against the Rotten Tomatoes machine. Uh, that's our battle cry. We'll find a movie on Rotten Tomatoes that is highly rated. Uh, a lot of times known as Certified Fresh with that oh-so-fancy little Rotten Tomatoes logo attached to it. The Certified Fresh sticker that you can find on where you can still buy DVDs and shit these days. I think even movie posters now are starting to incorporate them. But what we do with those fresh movies and those Certified Fresh joints is... Uh, We'll make a case for maybe why it's a bit overrated, maybe why the critics got this wrong, some of the things they overlooked or overhyped. We'll find ways to break these films down. Conversely, in alternating episodes, we'll find a movie on Rotten Tomatoes that is lowly rated, usually shoot about 30% and below. And what we'll do for that is, just as you would imagine, we'll find the positive merit in that film. Uh, good acting, good writing, um, you know, maybe some really cool themes or ideas that critics just were unjustly cruel about. Uh, we'll we'll find a way to build those movies up and make them presentable, uh, all in an effort to show, you know, the shit is subjective. You can be as over the moon or as cynical about something as you want to be if you really set your mind to it. And more often than not, what we discover is just showing that the Rotten Tomatoes ideology and system is kind of flawed because it doesn't always tell the whole story. Uh, but Julio, that all goes into the first half of our show here, uh, what we call Contrarian's Corner. 
If listeners want to know how we really feel about the movies we're discussing, they just have to hang around until the second half. That's correct. The second half of the show, aptly titled Real Talk, is where we tell you how we really feel about the movie. In this case, neither Alex or I had seen The Guard before. We've never talked about it previous to this recording, and we certainly don't know where each other stands. I, I don't know. Maybe Alex hates it. We know that I wanted Don Cheadle to be Irish, but that's that's as far as our knowledge goes. So once we get to Real Talk, we are each going to find out how the other one feels, along with the audience, because you guys don't know either. That's not exclusive to the guard. I mean, Julio just always wants Don Cheadle to be Irish. I just don't want him to get too comfortable. You yes. know, he's... Now that he has that war machine money, I, I don't want him to stop trying to to just become a better actor. What was the last uh, Avengers movie? Or, I don't know. What was the last Marvel movie he was in? Um, so his last movie was Endgame, but he also had a cameo on the first episode of uh, The Falcon and Winter Soldier. And he got nominated for a, an Emmy or a Golden Globe, I think, for it. <laughs> just ridiculous. Beautiful. All sounds remarkably on brand. Uh, Julio, 94%. And, you know, based on just uh, surface level looking at this shit, when it was presented to us and you sent it to me, I immediately looked it up on Rotten Tomatoes and then did a little bit more diving into it, reading some of the letterbox reviews for it. And it seems to be a pretty highly regarded movie, uh, an appreciated action comedy. So I'm curious which reviews you were able to wrangle up for this. Okay, so I got a... Got a few fresh tomatoes from the Rotten Tomatoes website. I'm going to start with Liam Lacey from Globe and Mail, who says, Although The Guard is primarily a language romp, it's also a terrific showcase for veteran pug face character actor Brendan Gleeson. Pug face. <laughs> pug face. <laughs> Show some goddamn respect, Liam Lacey. Next, James Crute from stuff.co.nz says, The Guard offers just over 90 minutes of excellent escapism and guaranteed hilarity that is still worth seeking out even a decade after its original release. So that's a pretty recent... Yeah, that's a a contemporary edition. It holds up a decade after. Um, And then Joseph Walsh from Cineview says, A superbly crafted comedy that gives a hilarious angle on Irish culture. In particular, it stays for inappropriate humor. Yeah, it's definitely heavy with that. Well, do you think maybe it goes a little over? <laughs> We've done another Irish movie uh, on this show. It's It's been a while, but uh, way back on episode 51, we actually had our friend Eddie Strait over, uh, and we did Sing Street. And one of the things that we discussed was that <laughs> Sing Street, with all its sweetness and its music and just the, the, the whimsicality of it all... Mm-hmm. Uh, it almost didn't feel like an Irish movie. <laughs> you know, like it wasn't Irish enough. It wasn't hardcore enough. And now, almost 100 episodes later, we are doing a movie that is extremely Irish. I would say almost to the point of being offensive. Uh, how do you think that <laughs> Irish who? people feel? <laughs> well, how do you think that Irish people feel about this movie? Like how it, this movie presents Ireland? Uh, I'm not going to speak for a country I don't live in, but I would imagine, based on my understanding of their culture, uh, I don't think they would view this as being misleading or too far off. They're like, fuck yeah, our cops are corrupt. <laughs> yeah, I was more concerned with like the inherent racism that comes along, but yeah, that too. <laughs> so the lead in this, as we mentioned, Brennan Gleeson plays Sergeant Jerry Boyle, who's uh, very jaded and... Um, I think inappropriate is a good word to describe him. Jaded and to the point of it becomes evident that he takes his job seriously um, when necessary and he can be good at it. He's like Michael Scott kind of, but with a bit more self-awareness in the sense of he's good at his job when duty calls, but he he's kind of over it and doesn't really take it seriously most of the time. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't care. He breaks the rules. We see him stealing somebody's money right like there's a car accident that he just uh he just comes up to the scene and he takes takes the drugs off them and he ends up doing like a hit of acid uh (laughs) that he finds on them he uh is a crass and confrontational and regularly indulging in drugs and alcohol even while on duty he's also shown to have a softer side showing concern for his ailing mother eileen 
But I, I would say the first 15 minutes of this movie exists to establish him as kind of someone who's just over it and in it for a paycheck now because uh, he doesn't feel challenged, I think, is the thing. And that what we find out throughout this movie is once that challenge rolls in, he he can still go. He can still put on his boots, his working boots and solve cases. But he's still corrupt. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he's not corrupt. He, he in the sense of like he's not taking bribes and shit like that, but he's just. He doesn't live a law-abiding life, that's for sure, because he's also very much into prostitutes, which I don't – I guess I don't know if that's legal <laughs> in Ireland, but um, I don't know. It feels like this opening set here and then the things he does throughout it, it just goes too far out of its way to repeatedly show us that he's not a good cop, uh, yet the movie wants us to cheer for him, so it gets a bit confusing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, the at the beginning – because uh, there's a there's a crime scene, and doesn't he ask the the new cop? He's like, "Hey, have you already like looked around for basically? Have you already looked around for things that we can take?" Mm-hmm. <laughs> the crime scene. That's come on. I, I I guess you know I I I don't know if there was ever a time to glorify corrupt cops, but now it's certainly not it. And it was just like, man, watching this opening, all I could do was hope that Don Cheadle was one going to be Irish and two going to be at least the voice of reason which he kind of turned out to be. So one out of two. <laughs> Betting 50-50 there, Mr. McDonough. Now, do you know Brendan Gleeson from anything? Yeah, I was trying to... I didn't look up his filmography before we watched this, but I've seen this guy plenty of times before. Uh, all right, so Braveheart immediately. Mission Impossible 2. Don't remember him. <laughs> oh, he's in The Village, which we just recently discussed. That's right. Yeah. 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 Well, That would be why he was still present on my mind yeah i imagine to the world at large uh, and this doesn't include you you're not part of the world at large but (laughs) most people would know him as uh one of the teachers in the harry potter movies okay he is uh he's mad eye moody the defense against the dark arts professor i think maybe i don't know he's he shows up in the fourth movie and then you know the the subsequent ones but i think of him and i see mad eye movie i'm not even a harry potter fan and i still think mad eye movie because you know he has this weird monocle in the harry potter verse and he's just you know he's a wizard he's all eccentric and uh so now i see him as a cop i just it's tough, man. Once you get cast in one of those big franchises, uh, not everybody's Cheadle. You know, Cheadle is like, he's War Machine, but he can just be something else. But Gleason, he's good. But in the end, I, I still saw Mad Eye Moody here. It's like, oh, it's Mad Eye Moody pretending to be a, a policeman. So Yeah, he's the general in Edge of Tomorrow. That would be probably the thing I know him from the most. Just my advice, if you want to continue to admire uh, Brendan Gleeson's craft, is just avoid the Harry Potter movies. <laughs> because <laughs> once you see him as a as a wizard teacher, then that's it. You're not going to see him as anything else. There's no going back? Nope. That's, gotcha. that's the magic, in quotation marks, of Harry Potter. Typecasting actors <laughs> throughout eight years. Eight movies. Boyle's got a pretty cool bedroom. That was one of my first notes was like, okay, is green going to be a significant color in this movie? And it definitely is. It's not like beating you over the head with it to per se, uh, but it seems like there's any moment of uh, transition and plot or something significant. There's a heavy reliance on the color green. I don't know if you noticed that, Julio. I did not. <laughs> well, there you go. I was still thinking of Mad-Eyed Moody. <laughs> So, new to the force uh, is his subordinate, McBride. And this is kind of an extension of what we were just talking about and establishing who he is as a police officer. They're investigating a killing, um, the five and a half killer. And it's a lot of, you know, police work, but mixed in with very, you know, I don't even want to say Tarantino dialogue because he doesn't really do the European style. So, I don't know, would Guy Ritchie be a more acceptable Guy Ritchie minus the sense of humor. It's like it's trying, but not quite there. There's an Obama joke pretty early on. Did you did you catch that? I did. Uh, I'm going to be honest. The way I watched this, subtitles weren't provided. And so there was some times where the accent was pretty thick and I was having a hard time breaking up what was being said. No offense to all of our <laughs> European listeners. 
<laughs> no offense to the Irish. Look, if this movie didn't offend them, I don't think that us not being able to to tell every word with dialogue without subtitles, I don't think that that's gonna make a difference. Um, but no, there's a, there's an Obama joke which felt it just dates the movie. I think that any Obama reference that is not made in the post-Trump era mm-hmm. instantly dates a movie dates anything you know as in like oh those were like the olden times <laughs> before <laughs> before america hit rock bottom <laughs> yeah uh, so it just kind of feels like i almost wanted to say too soon when that happened and then i was like no it actually just <laughs> happened before they had no idea uh but then as soon as i started giving uh mcdonough the the benefit of the doubt i want to say like 10 minutes later maybe even sooner uh there's a roman polanski joke <laughs> just <laughs> oh i didn't catch that yeah, and then I'm like, okay, no, he's out for blood. He doesn't care. <laughs> he just wants to get a reaction. And now that I can tell you too soon. <laughs> like a hundred years from now, it's still gonna be too soon. <laughs> no. But then you know, I guess that's that's kind of like the, the thing here that the McDonough, the writer director, he's more concerned with pushing buttons instead of being funny. And I think that that's why I, it doesn't work on a comedic level. It doesn't work as well as a, a Guy Ritchie movie. Like Guy Ritchie will have his c- characters talk about pop culture, but it's never... He never seems to be trying to offend anybody. Whereas, like, this guy, he seems to be trying to get a rise out of people. Yeah, it's definitely... Um, shock value is too intense and dramatic of a word to use, but it's definitely... Um... <laughs> It's not shock value. It's more of just like, you know, you. Uh, it's the that's the chainsaw. It's it's intended for you to <laughs> nudge your friend and go, ooh, he went there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as we mentioned, the character of Boyle, um, one of the bylines of the movie is him taking care of his mother, who's uh, unfortunately on the brink of death. I think they have three or four scenes throughout it where it's just really dialogue heavy stuff of them just you know kind of talking to one another uh until she eventually passes i know i'm kind of jumping ahead here to the end of the movie but i figured we could just go ahead and tackle this here i felt like uh, overall all this did was again just a trope to try to make us relate more or have more of like um view boil more as a hero despite some of the things we were seeing elsewhere and hearing uh, the things he was saying and doing in the end i just kind of found all these scenes with his mom to be kind of boring and just a distraction from what was at large. I don't know how you felt about him. Well, yeah, they're, they're pretty manipulative. I think that's the problem that I, you and I, and I imagine most people watching the movie, they were aware that it, like, it's a very transparent attempt at, like you said, that humanizing him and just, you know, Hey, can you really blame the guy? His mom is sick. His mom is dying. You know, just give him a break. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. That's just commit. You know, if you want your protagonist to be a son of a bitch, then just make him a son of a bitch. Don't give him a mom that's dying because then that's cheating. That's just, you're stacking the deck. You know, th- this movie would be more interesting if he was just just a guy that doesn't have a sympathetic side. And yet, in spite of all that, he manages to be the hero and save the day. But but no, the the, the movie constantly gives him an out and it's just, the, the mom is like the biggest thing, but then also, you know, it turns out that he actually, uh, he's not racist. He just likes fucking with people. <laughs> It, it, and so on so yeah it it just felt uh I, I just felt manipulated that was the main thing even even more so than it being boring it was just kind of a, a little insulting so boyle attends a briefing by an fbi agent from america wendell everett uh, my note here says enter don Cheadle," and then comma immediate racism relentless he's sent to work with garda which is basically the division of law enforcement that boils in uh they're looking to take down a group of uh, drug traffickers in Ireland. And the, the leader is Francis Shahi Skeffington. And the whole point of this movie is he's waiting for this huge delivery that's going to come in. That's like the climax of the movie, kind of jumping ahead. Uh, but Don Cheadle has come over from America to put a stop to this big drug ring that's going on, this trafficking that's going on through Ireland. Uh, and... The first thing Boyle asks him, because he sees the pictures of the, the suspects here, the people that they're trying to apprehend, he says, I thought drug dealers were black or Mexican. And it's very, very uncomfortable. And it's eventually explained that he's just, you know, messing with them or taking the piss, as they like to say. Uh, but it makes for a few awkward moments of film. 
Yeah, I mean, when you say something that is racially insensitive, saying just kidding after doesn't mean that it's not racially insensitive. <laughs> it's still bad. And this movie does it over and over again. It's, it's a running, uh, I don't want to say a running joke, but it's just like a running theme throughout the entire movie. It's just him constantly saying something very inappropriate in front of uh, uh, Don Cheadle, sometimes directly at Don Cheadle, and then just laughing, going like, ah, I gotcha. I'm not really racist. I just say racist things. He says right here, and I quote, I'm Irish. It's part of my culture. Yes. <laughs> Again, how does an Irishman feel about that? <laughs> Listeners, let us know. Uh, Boyle calls out, you know, after all this, though, and, you know, they get back on course, get their focus back. He recognizes one of the men in the presentation was the guy. Like, he hey, saw that's it. Mark Strong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He knows that he was the victim of the murder that he had been investigating with his new partner. And so he takes him and um, shows him the d- dead body in the uh, the morgue. Uh, he says, you know, we'll put it this way. I hope he's dead because he was taken down in the morgue earlier today. Um, Mark Strong enters the fold here. Big, brooding, intimidating presence that he brings. Uh, McBride, the, you know, new on the force, just a bit too overzealous, a bit too excited to be there. He's the guy that if it was a nom movie, you know, he was going out first and um, <laughs> he pulls his car over. Mark strong is the hired gun here for Shahi and um, uh, his other henchmen that he has uh, basically without any real provocation. He just was messing with the wrong people. These guys shoot uh, Mark strong specifically shoots down. Uh, no, 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 it's not Mark strong. It's the other guy, right? Yeah, because uh, the other guy is allegedly the the, the psychopath or sociopath. <laughs> it's one of the two. Uh, so there's the leader who is played by uh, Liam Cunningham. Which, yes. Yeah, this doesn't mean anything to you, Alex, but he's a he's a big character in Game of Thrones. Okay. I didn't recognize him until the very end when they're doing the cutesy end credits, and he just says Liam Cunningham. I was like, oh my god, is Sir Davos playing an asshole? Uh, so he's a leader. Mark Strong is kind of like the the silent type, the, the, he thinks he's too good for all this. The other and guy's the other Liam. Guy. Yeah, uh, David Wilmot. And he's the yeah. guy that, yeah. He shoots uh, McBride here and just guns him down. It's pretty sad. It's like, man, that guy, so far he was the only character that really seemed overall like pure, and now he's dead. Yeah, he, he was the only cop that uh, that actually cared to uphold the law. <laughs> His wife eventually comes to uh, Boyle and is like, hey, my husband's missing. And he promises that he's going to help her figure out what's going on. <laughs> my note says, Irish Mira Sorvino. And then like a minute later, she explains that she's not Irish. She's from uh, <laughs> Croatia. <laughs> so, Croatia Mira Sorvino. Yeah, my note says, oh, man, they killed the rookie. Um, <laughs> we get some getting to know you action between uh, Brennan Gleason and Don Cheadle. Just kind of, you know, where they're from. Uh, talking about geography, we get a story about how Brendan Gleeson went to Disney World by himself, which that is a terrifying idea of just seeing him <laughs> waiting in line alone. <laughs> the, the, so that's a, that's a thing that I, I don't know. I, I think that it's more prevalent in America, the, just this aversion towards anybody doing anything on their own. And I thought that this movie was going to really lean into that. And, and you know, because the whole point uh, of the movie is to contrast. Once once you team them up, it's the contrast between how how Irish Brendan Gleeson is and how American Don Cheadle is. Uh, but the movie doesn't really do much with it. And this is one of those moments where I felt the, the cultural divide, right? Because Cheadle looks horrified when he hears that, that Brendan Gleeson went to Disneyland on his own just the previous year. <laughs> He wasn't a kid. He was just an adult, an adult riding Space Mountain over and over. And it's well, like, not the so- idea of going alone. It's just Brandon Gleason standing in line for like the Snow White cart ride would be not. <laughs> if I had kids, I'd be like, hey, get behind me. <laughs> it, well, but but that's the thing, right? The, I mean, uh, the the picture if. If Don Cheadle is a representative of America in this movie, and he is because there's nobody else, then he comes across as really judgmental, and the movie never really gives him a reason, like a, a way to kind of expand on what he thinks, right? So it comes across as a, like, oh, there's something wrong with 
an adult doing things on its own. You know, it's like if you're an adult and you don't have a, you don't have kids, well, forget about it. You, you're not allowed in Disneyland. That's just how it is. Which, okay, well, if we're gonna if you're gonna paint Americans as that intolerant, that's cool. But then really do something with it. it, it but the movie quickly backs off from that kind of stuff, from that kind of conflict, and goes for you know easier stuff. Like uh, you were talking about the trope of uh, you know the rookie that's that has a, his wife back home and, of course, is the first one to, to get killed. And, like, Cheadle starts talking about his wife and kids and uh, telling Gleason about it and he wants to show him a photo. And that's when I thought they were going to kill him off. I'm like, oh, man, this is... Cheadle's not going to make it out of this movie alive because, you know, he started sharing about his girl back home. Oh, yeah. That's cl- yeah, that's a classic war movie thing. If you, you start telling that shit. Or, you know, when he... I guess what saved him was he wasn't able to take out the picture of his kids. If we had seen the picture of his kids, then that would have been all she wrote. <laughs> yeah. But that, that lack of awareness, like if you were an FBI agent, if you were a cop, whatever, would you ever show a picture of your wife and kids to anyone? Uh, Having seen all the movies you've seen. Oh, no. Absolutely not. <laughs> I thought you were talking about like in this, uh, the universe of films, but no. Yeah. Seeing what I've seen, it's like the scream thing. You never say I'll be right back because you won't be right back. So, uh, <laughs> Don Cheadle just barely escaped with his life here. Um, in kind of a montage sequence of Don Cheadle, you know, getting to know the area that he's in, we, we get a shot of Boyle swimming out in the ocean. And he states <laughs> that he was fourth in the 1988 Olympics in Seoul in the 1500 freestyle swimming. This is just kind of getting ahead of some trivia here. But in the end of the movie, Everett says that's not true, that it's not true, and the photographer. Uh, kid replies, it's easy to look up. In the 1988 Olympics, the fourth place in this event was won by an American named Matt Ketlinski. The other contestants mentioned were real. Two Germans won the second and third place, uh, Stefan Pfeiffer and Uwe Dasselier, respectively. And the first place was won by Soviet Vladimir Salnikov. And uh, <laughs> I don't know. I just always think it's funny when there's some like wild accusation made by a character in a movie like this where... Brennan Gleason alleges that he was an Olympic athlete. And he does have that line, though, about, like, I came in fourth, so it doesn't even matter that I was there to begin with. <laughs> I really thought that the end of that trivia was going to be that Brendan Gleason was, the like, the actor Brendan Gleason <laughs> had come in fourth. Just like him, you know, bald with the cap on, svelte. Just <laughs> not, you know, chiseled, because swimmers are usually just really fit toned athletes but brandon gleason there on the olympic podium or right below it since he came in fourth place but um don Cheadle everett is anxious to get working on the case and he basically prepares everything that he's gonna be working on and goes to boyle and boyle just explains well it's my day off which i respected this part of the movie so much (laughs) because there's i've gotten to a certain point in my life where working hard isn't going to fix anything or working harder or, you know, not taking that day off is going to fix anything. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I respect the idea of like, yeah, I understand my work's going to be here when I get back, but today's my day off. So I'm taking my day off differently. Uh, I I don't spend my day off going and finding two prostitutes and spending a day (laughs) with them in a, (laughs) but if you wanted to, you could. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. The options there. I mean, it's your day off. Um, no, I think the difference is that, in this particular case, like Gleason says, it's not going to make a difference. And it would have made a difference because it's a, you know, th- there's a deadline. They're, they're against a ticking clock here. And without Gleason to escort him, Don Cheadle can't do anything. Like He can't really communicate with the people in the area that he's supposed to be investigating. So Gleason taking a day off, as honorable, as self-righteous as it was, it, it really put a damper on the, on the investigation. It did, but sadly, uh, and things happen for a reason type mentality, his drive back from his visit with the prostitutes, he came across McBride's cop car. uh, And this, you know, just kind of adds a whole new wrinkle to what's going on here. You know, they think they have the answers, but it really just ends up to creating more questions because the car is found at what they call a suicide hotspot uh, that's on the coast and where police officers have gone to kill themselves, uh, but they don't. But he does not believe that McBride killed himself, right? And the wife doesn't think that could be possible. Yeah, he actually tells the wife he w- that uh, her husband was not smart enough to commit suicide. <laughs> and this is where we learn that uh, he was gay uh, and that they got married. It was like a green card type situation, right? 
Right. Which I I felt that the movie was opening the door for for a relationship to develop between Gleason and and the wife. Mm-hmm. You know, like very easily removing the idea of oh man, he can't hook up with his his dead colleague's wife. But now it's like oh well, they were never really an actual couple. It was just a it was all pretend. But then it's I guess McDonough wrote that on the first draft, and then on, on the following drafts, it kind of forgot about the plot line because it doesn't really go anywhere. I'm curious if the Everett character developed like a slight drinking problem just hanging around Boyle throughout this because it just seems like every time they're together, he's just making him drink more and more. <laughs> um, but it le- ends up you know, working out in their favor because they get the idea at this bar they're at to pull the surveillance footage and they find the suspect they had in the murder case. They find the footage that he was there and his alibi is legitimate. Uh, but they also use that because they see the... Shahi and uh, Mark, Mark Strong, Strong there. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody always recognizes Mark Strong. <laughs> it just, you're watching regular uh, security footage and you go, oh shit, it's Mark Strong. It must be a Guy Ritchie movie. <laughs> he was in Kick Ass. <laughs> so, but, but speaking of Mark Strong, though. Do you feel like, yeah, we know who he is. And I guess he is like, we know his name, but the average person probably goes like, oh, it's that guy. You Mm -hmm. know, they don't know that that's Mark Strong. But he, by now, it almost feels like he should be a bigger name. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But he isn't. I wonder if it's because he just, he has been a little too generous with with the roles he takes. And so he's... It's no longer special to see Mark Strong in a movie because he he just shows up. He's like Christopher Walken. You know, it's like, oh, wait, there he is again doing his Mark Strong thing. Like, Walken is a great actor, but usually movies get him and they require him to just do the Christopher Walken shtick. And same thing with, with Mark Strong. I feel like now they know what he can do, so now mm-hmm. they, they get him to do that and nothing else. <laughs> so he's just kind of limited, even though he's a talented guy. He's limited. And here, you know, it's just he's doing Guy Ritchie light. Uh, he has three or four scenes where he's just he has this sort of smart ass dialogue. You know, at one point he's talking about philosophers. And then at some other point, he's he gets into an argument with the cops because, uh, you know, they're paying off the cops. We find out that they, they have all the cops in their pocket. Oh, yeah. And with and Mark Strong is collecting. No, he's delivering the money to the chief of police, and they get into this really weird conversation about you know why would I short you? You know, it, it's this sort of a weird. Uh, I don't want to. It's not even intellectual humor, but you know, like one of the reviews that I quoted, it, they were calling it like a comedy of words or something, a comedy of language. It was like, yeah, but if the language is not great, then don't even bother. You know, and I feel like Mark Strong should be above this kind of stuff by now. You know, once he's done Guy Ritchie movies where they nail this type of dialogue, then when he comes down to do something like this, it reflects poorly on him. <laughs> you know, it just looks like he, he doesn't have a filter. He'll just take whatever whatever role they offer him. Uh, that would be very accurate because, Julio, this is Mark Strong's uh, second 2011 entry in Contrarian's canon. <laughs> and the... Far more offensively was the other entry, a previously covered film by the name of the Green Lantern that we did on here. <laughs> Forgot that he was Sinestro. <laughs> I know. He's a uh, Th- Thial Sinestro. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. You said above, though. He comes out above, and that is a good choice of words. Cause I, I Googled, how tall is Mark Strong? Because he like towers over everyone in this movie. He's only 6'2". I mean, I'm like 5'9 or some shit, so he would, I'd have to look up to him, but he looks like, uh, you know, he comes across like seven foot tall in this movie. Just a big cat. I guess his uh, his cohorts are short. And so yeah, he looks even go. bigger. So as you mentioned, Mark Strong's going around just bribing people, saying, you know, look the other way, go have an Eskimo pie when when this time comes, when the our big shipment comes in. Shay, he believes it's not going to be so easy with Boyle. So he ends up, one, blackmailing him. One of the prostitutes he was with so, took some pictures while they were engaging in their sexual acts, their fornication, their <laughs> their sins. And so there's that. And he shows up as the prostitute's telling him this. They're like in a sweet shop somewhere, an ice cream parlor. 
and he shows up and he's just like and on top of it and he sli- he does the classic slides the envelope uh halfway across the table <laughs> and you know is offering him a bribe this actually to me was one of the funnier scenes in this cuz he's just powering through this giant milkshake <laughs> while Shay he's just <laughs> explaining to him the situation at hand and then when he gets up to leave he's like rubbing his head and the girl's like what are you going to do he's like i've got a terrible ice cream headache right now <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm not going to do an Irish accent. I, I tried, and it's just Boston, so there, there's no point. Uh, this would be more effective if the movie, if that scene wasn't padded with just some bullshit dialogue about the song. That they spend a couple minutes just talking about the meaning of the song. And they just the completely background. gloss over the fact that the the prostitute that he was with, and she seems like a nice girl, got the shit beat out of her. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, and, and now, how does this blackmail thing exactly work? Like, they... So it is it illegal for him to to be because he's not married he doesn't have a family so yeah, it's I'm not more like, curious like I'm sure it's more illegal for him to take a bribe than to be caught with a prostitute <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean what is it is it just like a naked picture of him it, it, so he doesn't strike me as the kind of guy that would give a shit you know what mm-hmm. I mean like okay post a picture of me having sex what do I care. You know, I've done worse and everybody knows it. So it, it seems like a weird thing, unless, like you said, maybe it is illegal to to engage in sex with with prostitutes in Ireland. Once again, Irish people listening to this show, please let us know. Is that like the most illegal thing you can do? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, because I'm pretty sure his aiding and abetting and this shipment of fucking half a billion dollars in cocaine would be a bigger deal than him getting his dick sucked by a prostitute <laughs> and he, he's an honest guy too he tells him like he, i don't think he's worried about that the, one of the things we hear him tell the prostitutes is that he has a small penis he's just an honest guy <laughs> just a regular guy that's the movie once again trying to trying to get you on his side you know yeah he's corrupt and he's racist but he's got a small dick, so you know, cut him some slack. That that more so than the mother stuff made me, you know, more endeared to him because I was like, "Brother, I get it, man. It, it's it's and our life. It. It's our way of walking through this life. I get it." <laughs> so now that I'm fully endeared to Boyle, uh, his mother passes away as we covered. That's uh, that comes and goes. We kind of already touched on that. That's just my note here. As the investigation continues, though, because everyone's been paid off, there's not much they can do. There's the young boy around town who helps Boyle uh, find like this massive cache of hidden weaponry. It's from the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, uh, mm-hmm. and he arranges that it be returned to an IRA member. So we get to see a guy wearing a cowboy hat in Ireland, which was news to me. That was pretty, <laughs> <laughs> big pretty deal. colorful. So I, I glossed over the fact that his mom dies. His mom actually died from an overdose. She basically killed herself with her medication, which definitely makes that situation. I, for the tone this movie's going for, don't you think that that is a bit too dark? Yeah, and unnecessary because it doesn't really do anything. Uh, it's not like because his mother dies of an overdose, he suddenly becomes determined to stop this drug shipment. I mean, I mean he was already working towards doing it you know what i mean like it would be different if he had just decided that he wasn't going to do anything and then his mom dies and then he makes a decision to well now i'm going to honor her memory by stopping these guys but he was Mm -hmm. already doing it he was already if you i I know i say this a lot when it when there's plot lines that are unnecessary but that's because you know it's is the necessary point to make <laughs> if you remove the subplot of uh Gleason's mother the movie doesn't change because that story has no relevance on on the plot yeah it's just there to buy time it's a 90 minute movie and they were still looking for fluff looking for filler <laughs> how do we fluff this movie <laughs> let's make a Kill really depressing st- <laughs> uh the- <laughs> like I imagine there was one other idea of like let's get him a love interest no let's kill his mom fuck yeah <laughs> uh, he gets a situation with the guns taken care of the main thing that comes of it is this guy explains a way that you can hide a, a certain type of gun in the crotch of your pants you need to keep that in mind um, 
How like- how hard did you laugh, Alex? When uh, I just remember <laughs> that scene where uh, there, uh, you know, Sir Davos is explaining to Gleason at the ice cream shop that everybody has been bought, and he's the only one that's missing. Uh, and then Gleason says, "Well, how about Don Cheadle?" And Sir Davos goes, "Like, oh, the American? Okay, no, Americans can't be bought. We're not even gonna try." <laughs> <laughs> Little do they know. I don't know. It was just so cute that they would think that. <laughs> yeah, it was a very uh, naive way of looking at it. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it though. Whereas now, like you know, if there was any movie now made. Uh, like this with the what we know about America now, they would just be like, they're not even worth wasting money on. <laughs> America, the American kid probably can't even find the door to leave his hotel room. Yeah. We're not worried about it. Oh, well, Amazon Prime it to him. <laughs> so Everett, Don Cheadle feels he's figured out wh- where the shipment's coming in and how it's going to unfold. But he has the wrong location, right? Yeah, because the basically, unbeknownst to him, the entire police department <laughs> has been bought by by the bad guys. So they're all his investigators are feeding him wrong information, and so they've mm. uh, sent all the resources, Cheadle included, to the furthest place from where the the actual delivery of the drugs is going to take place. That's right, because uh, once Boyle figures it out, he calls him and tells him, you know, turn around type thing. Because Boyle goes back home and he's confronted by the the loose cannon, as we mm-hmm. talked about earlier, uh, O'Leary, uh, Liam O'Leary, who they do kind of the pumpkin and jewels, <laughs> where they're just sitting and uh, Le- uh, O'Leary's just pointing a gun at him and saying, basically just telling him he shouldn't have gotten involved. And... Boyle then began scratching his crotch, saying he must have caught something from the prostitutes he was with. And this is where we see him fishing around in you know, the crotch of his pants. And if you were paying attention to that scene earlier, you figured out, oh, he's going to pull a gun out and shoot this guy. And that's exactly what happens. It's it's funny, but it's also kind of a cool fuck yeah moment. It's one of the few times in the movie where I was like rooting for Boyle. And that should really tell you something. It's a scene where he's just <laughs> digging around in his pants. Uh, you know, it's... <laughs> Something you literally like in Tropic Thunder when Jack Black does that same thing to find his gun. I found this to be the most endearing part of the movie. <laughs> it's also kind of it's interesting because I thought that he was faking the, the you know that he got crabs from the prostitute, but mm-hmm. then after the scene, he's still scratching his crotch. <laughs> I think he even makes a comment about how like uh, something about the the prostitute screwing him over. So so he actually had crabs, right? <laughs> Is that what happened? Uh, I think so. He, he's uh, Boyle's acting is not that good to some of the extent that he's uh, stretching this. <laughs> he's stayed in character. Yeah. <laughs> so he killed O'Leary, and then he calls, as we mentioned, Everett, and explains, no, this is actually where it's coming in. We got to go meet here. Uh, they're going to be unloading the cocaine tonight, and this is, you know, it's now or never type thing. <laughs> and Everett, Don Cheadle arrives, and then figures out like pretty promptly it's just them they're just going to be a two-man army we do get like the you know the prepping for battle sequence where uh brennan gleason boyle gets his uniform out and it's nicely pressed and ready to go and as the audience i think i think we're supposed to believe that you know he's walking into certain death here Uh, it's a movie so i always expected him to prevail but (laughs) him and don Cheadle manages them against this drug army yeah well i thought that the cheeto was gonna was gonna buy the farm here mm. and he gets shot at one point he does uh, before they open fire we do get one last kind of comedic guy Ritchie esque back and forth where he asks don cheeto have you been shot before and asking him if it hurts and he asks him how many times this is three times He's like well you should be used to it by now <laughs> and then they approach and that's where the um shay he francis is like it's the guard which i can't tell you how hard I laughed at that. Just like, yeah, we got the name of the movie in. <laughs> he's not even tried to take cover. Does he have a death wish? I thought that he wanted to stop. Oh, them. no, he's, he's playing just... like this is a person that has no idea how you're supposed to play Metal Gear Solid, trying Metal Gear Solid, like just <laughs> running in completely defenseless with no shield. But yeah, he just walks forward. Uh, the solace is he's a great shot because he picks these guys off and he's got reinforcement. Don Cheadle like manning a fucking assault rifle. 
but yeah, he is able to kill Mark Strong. He gets shot himself. He quips, you know, to no one in particular, just a flesh wound. And then uh, it's Shahi attempting to get away, right? And he jumps in like this little boat and mm-hmm. Boyle follows him. Yeah, then Sheetle, Sheetle accidentally, I guess, blows up something in the boat. <laughs> Because it just there's this massive explosion, and then suddenly there's everything is in flames. And uh, why is uh, she here, Shehi? Shehi? Why is the bad guy? Why is he in bed? You know, when Gleason finally catches up to him, the the main bad guy, he's just he's, he's laying in his water bed with a lot of heim. <laughs> it was good for his back. He was a little stressed out. Uh, yeah, he's. I, I guess I don't know. That's shit, man. When I'm in distress, that's what I do is I go crawl in bed. So I I can kind of sympathize with this guy. Uh, but yeah, that that's uh, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, the, the big climax of the movie is just Brendan Gleeson basically being unstoppable. He just barrels through all the bad guys. Mark Strong gets disposed of just <laughs> without much fanfare. Yeah, he really does. It was kind of uh, surprising. Yeah, after all the build up to his character. He, uh, he even has two guns, I think, in, in this firefight. And he just mm-hmm. gets shot like really quickly. Uh, and then, yeah, the Brendan Gleeson gets into the boat. Oh, he doesn't even shoot Sir Davos. He, uh, he just leaves him to, to burn, I guess. And then Don Cheadle watches from, the, from a distance as the boat explodes. Yeah. Assuming that Gleeson has also gone down with the, with the bad guys. Did you think that he was done? Dude, it's the Dark Knight Rises ending. <laughs> the next scene is them unveiling the statue or of, uh, the you know the <laughs> autopilot got fixed you know who's the name on that <laughs> boil hmm but yeah it, it is the fucking dark knight rises ending because the the closing shot is don Cheadle like looking out on the water you know like oh they'll never know who saved the city uh but the little boys back there and the creepy photographer is just talking about how he was a good swimmer and that's whenever it like is really like that. Eh, that was bullshit. Uh, and then they flash back to like a conversation in this movie that Boyle said like if he pulled this off he'd he'd have to leave town anyway. And then Don Cheadle remembering something he had said about he's either the dumbest man or the smartest man he ever met. So it's definitely ambiguous. And like I said, you know the hero wins, and it seems like he just had to get gone. We needed one final shot of uh, Brendan Gleeson having lunch. On an outdoor restaurant with uh, <laughs> with the widow of his ex partner, <laughs> I guess Don Cheadle's watching them from a from a nearby table and just smiles and nods. Has a very small glass of wine with him, yeah. And then um, we go into kind of fun, quirky credits. Well, before that, we get a massive written and directed by. <laughs> just that's what I mean. It's like all the credits they give here are in this giant blocky red font. That's how you announce your arrival. I did in, this uh... shit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so John Michael McDonough takes us out with his uh, cast of merry men and women. And it's freeze frames for all the characters except for Brendan Gleeson, who gets his live action credit like it's the opening of a 90s sitcom. <laughs> and then Brendan Gleeson says, the guard. <laughs> But with an Irish accent. <laughs> Correct. I can say some things with an Irish, an Irish accent, just the guard apparently is not one of them. But uh, <laughs> yeah, we get a happy ending, uh, not without a little bit of melancholy, but Don Cheadle realizes he learned something about himself and about you know the cops around the world. So uh, I guess everyone wins. He just had to put up with some outright racism to get there. <laughs> He learned to loosen up and tolerate the racism because it was well intentioned. <laughs> Jesus. All right, so that was the guard. That was Contrarian's Corner. Mm-hmm. Let's let's find out how we actually felt. Let's go to real talk. Let's do it. And James McCormick out of Limerick. Now these men are highly dangerous. And if yes, Sergeant, I thought only black lads were throat eaters. I'm sorry. What? I thought only black lads were throat eaters. And Mexicans. What do they call them? Do I have a word for them? Yeah, there's a word for you too, sir. But I'm not going to go into that right now. Anyway, as I was saying, these men are highly dangerous. And if mules. You are- drug mules. 
That, that's enough for your guff now, Boyle. Apologize to the man. Huh? Apologize for what? Uh, you know for what? For your racist slurs, for one thing. I'm Irish, sir. Racism is part of my culture. That's enough now, Boyle. You're showing us up, man. You're a fucking knacker. Fuck off back to Dublin, you. you rip your fucking head off, Relax, Boyle! Relax. Sit down! No, no, lads, come on. Not in front of the American. And we are back. But before we go into real talk, it's time for PP, our patron pitch. This is where we let our patrons know what they can expect on our exclusive patron feed. And it's also where we let non-patrons know what they're missing out on. Closing down January is this episode place, which means that... All the January goodies should be already on the feed. Uh, quick video reviews for Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle from Alex and for Ferdinand from me. Uh, we also have a exclusive bonus episode about Jawbreaker requested by Ryan. And then the, the, the other stuff, you know, the uh, pre-recording notes for all our episodes of January. And further back, mm -hmm. also the cutting room floor segment, uh, all the clips that they make it into our episodes. Part two of the Rock versus Cena saga that, that we have going on, uh, in which yeah. Alex is going to walk me through what happened after The Rock challenged John Cena in the year that followed. And we're going to talk about Fast Five and The Reunion. One of those movies is a lot more popular than the other. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, of course, Contrarious After Hours. The spin-off show where we talk about other things that we've watched, that we've played, that we've read, that we've listened to. Uh, Alex, what are you bringing to Contrarious After Hours this time? Julio, I haven't really had the opportunity to watch, play, read anything new recently. Uh Real life is gotten in the way, unfortunately. But I, I did watch and recommend you watch a movie called Smithereens uh, on HBO yes. Max, also a Criterion release, which I looked that up afterwards, and I was like, yeah, I'm definitely going to wait for the sale because the Blu-ray is like 50 bucks. So that is actually an extension of a recent discussion from After Hours where we talked about Desperately Seeking Susan because that was directed by Susan Settleman, and I looked up her filmography and Smithereens was like her most highly acclaimed one. 100% Rotten Tomatoes, Criterion Treatment, all that. So uh, we'll talk about watching that. I imagine, Julio, we can uh, give our conflicting thoughts on it as it is some <laughs> definitive white people shit. And yes. um, speaking of white people shit, I will also be discussing the physical media release of Halloween Kills, which came out last week. Uh, that's, I misunderstood the press release uh, about the blu-ray initially i thought it was going to be a like an alternate version of the movie an alternate cut it's actually just an extended version of it but it does have an alternate ending and um i will be discussing that and why i'm very over the moon happy that it remained an alternate ending and not the one that they used in the actual theatrical release so does does evil actually die <laughs> the alternate no cut? It, <laughs> nothing really changes in terms of things that you know big story devices or big you know plot twists but it just kind of is an extended version of the ending and something really fucking stupid happens and so <laughs> i look forward to explaining that to you as well as uh just an overall review of the release of it it's got a pretty good lineup of special features so uh nothing too juicy but definitely some talking points that we can hit it, it does sound juicy enough alex uh, on my end i will be following through on a promise from a few months ago when i first brought up the show babylon 5 i'd said that i'd started it i was maybe 10 episodes in and i i was you know i, I appreciated it for what it was trying to do and i said i will check in again when i'm halfway through the show so it's it's five seasons and i just finished season three and uh I mean, I'll tell you about it in detail, but uh, I, I will, here I will say that the show gets exponentially better and exponentially more interesting <laughs> as the seasons go along. And I, I finished season three really pumped for the next two seasons and with a much better, with, with a higher appreciation of the, the entire show compared to when I gave my, my impressions, you know, a few months ago. So that's mm -hmm. one thing. And then also... Uh, this long weekend gave me the opportunity to basically binge all seven episodes of the HBO show 
Mayor of East Town, which you might okay. know as the the Kate Winslet show. <laughs> she's uh, she's been doing the awards round, and uh, it's it's been pretty pretty well reviewed. I managed like I had it on the periphery. I knew that she had a show on HBO, and I knew that it was doing well. I didn't know anything else about it though, which is great because there's some really good surprises on the you know on this season. I don't know if there's even gonna be a follow up. You know, it's, it it works as a standalone story, but uh, she's a cop in a small town and. A lot of shit happens. <laughs> There's a murder investigation. Her her personal life is a mess. And it's Kate Winslet. So she could be anything. I would watch it. Uh, oh, yeah. This is established. Yes, I know. Contrarians listeners from a while back, you know you know how I feel about Kate Winslet. So, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about, about it on After Hours. So, Mayor of Easttown, Babylon 5 up to the end of Season 3, uh, mm. Smithereens, and the DVD slash Blu-ray of Halloween Kills, in which evil still doesn't die. All that on After Hours and all the other stuff on our Patreon channel. So if any of it sounds interesting, uh, go check our, our Patreon at patreon.com slash contrarian prime. Look at our tiers, see if uh, you feel like contributing to the contrarian supplements. $1, $3, $5, $10. We have our different tiers that we offer so just a buck. You can go throw it our way and just see if you like it. Uh, see if there's something there you enjoy, and if there's not, if there's something you'd like to see us add, we're open to it. For our current patrons, we love y'all, and we're currently accepting applications for new ones. So check it out. We know you're going to like it, and we know you're going to stay, and you're going to have to keep going because you're going to want us to cover some movie. Every time I think we're getting kind of long in the tooth, someone will suggest a movie or demand a movie like we covered here today that I'm like, man, there's still so much out there for us. Because <laughs> I feel like we've conquered some really big mountains in terms of like Titanic and you know Terminator and all that shit. Uh, not just James Cameron movies, but um, <laughs> there's still plenty out there for us to discuss. So head on over to patreon.com slash contrarian prime check out our cutting room floor material after hours check out the first part uh that's up right now and soon to be second part of our rock cena 10 years later retrospective and it's only going to keep growing that's all i can say we keep figuring out more and more things to do for it so julio patron is the reason we're here this evening discussing yes the guard uh, i forgot to ask in the first half of the podcast how did you watch this movie Good old Amazon Prime. You know, it's funny because when we we were talking about The Guard, I think it was the last episode, you thought I was talking about The Guardian. And of course, when I started doing the search for the movie, The Guardian showed mm-hmm. up before The Guard showed up. Because I guess there you go. Kevin Costner and uh, Ashton Kutcher <laughs> carry more star power than Brendan Gleeson and Don Cheadle, surprisingly. It's the way of the gun. But yeah, no, I was pretty happy with the, with the transfer, the quality. Uh, how about you? So it Showtime currently has the the broadcast rights for the guard, um, and so it was on demand through our cable system. That's how I watched it. It, it was okay quality wise. Like I said, there were no subtitles or anything like that. But every time I can take advantage of the free on demand system that they have, I, I take full advantage of it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you missed a, a Roman Polanski joke, but that's okay. Yes, yeah, I, I'll I'll make it. I think. I, I think you and I have made plenty of them off recording air to get us through a lifetime. So, <laughs> all right, Hulu, ninety four percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Certainly seems like this movie has its uh, fan base. For the purposes of Rotten Tomatoes, the thing that was important was that the critics liked it. Now, ninety four percent though leaves a door open, meaning you guessed it, six percent of those critics didn't really care for it. <laughs> so those that were not enamored and smitten by Brennan Gleeson, what uh, what were their complaints? Alex, I'm going to start with a quote from a critic that has an amazing name. Uh, this is David N. Butterworth. Nice. <laughs> Love it. Uh, from La Movie Booth. He says, to paraphrase Nigel Terry in The Lion in Winter. I, the- I'm over this guy already. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, to paraphrase Nigel Terry in The Lion in Winter, the guard is a stinker and it stinks. <laughs> Butterworth. We started so so strongly and then it went downhill very quick. 
Next, Chris Hewitt from St. Paul Pioneer Press says, Brendan Gleeson is always worth seeing, but there are much better places to see him. <laughs> like the Harry Potter movies. It, the Village. So, d- yeah, to kind of interject here again, you were explaining this. So he has like a sizable role in the Harry Potter movie. Z- yes. Yeah. He's like, I mean, he's not like Alan Rickman, but he is. Yeah, he, he's a recurring character once okay. he gets introduced in the fourth movie. So he has four, five, six, seven, and eight that he's in. So children, you know, there's a whole generation. You know, like whenever you see Alan Rickman, well, yeah, I mean, you and I, we were like, oh, Alan Rickman. But for a while, we would be like, oh, that's Hans from Die Hard. Yeah. And I think that there's a whole generation that would that saw Alan Rickman. They're like, oh, that's Professor Snape from Harry Potter. That same generation, they see Brendan Gleeson, and they're like, oh, that's Mad-Eye Moody. And it's going it. to take a while for them to get over that, which is fine. I mean, I'm sure that the, those royalties are pretty sweet. I don't think he cares. Yeah, I was about to say, I'm sure, I, I'm sure he's not mad about it. All right, and let's close with Peter Rayner from Christian Science Monitor, who says, this black comedy needed to be a whole lot blacker and funnier. Do you think Peter Rayner is saying that Don Cheadle is not black enough? Uh, I don't, and I would hope that wasn't his intention. <laughs> Get me someone blacker than Don Cheadle. That guy's more racist than anything else that happens in the movie. Uh, both you and I are known fans of European style of writing, especially when it comes to action movies. Both Guy Ritchie fans, and obviously that's he's not the only one, but that would be the most successful one uh, to discuss as we also made several comparisons in the first portion. So I'm curious uh, where this ended up sitting for you. I guess my first question should be, have you seen anything else from this director or writer, from uh, John Michael McDonough? I have, actually. I, I watched uh, Calvary in theaters when it came out. I, oh, nice. Yeah, I knew it was it was getting good reviews. I probably heard about it on Film Spotting or one of those film review podcasts, and uh, it was playing at the. It's probably at the Arbor because it wasn't like a big release, but uh, I went and saw it, and it's uh, it's very different from this one. I mean, it's a lot more serious. Uh, Brendan Gleeson plays, if I remember correctly, he plays a priest. The movie starts with him getting a confession from someone, but he can't see the face of the person that's confessing. But that person mm-hmm. is either confessing to a murder or confessing that they're about to commit a murder. And then the murder happens, and Brendan Gleeson spends the entire movie kind of trying to figure out who was the person that confessed to him uh, in the morning. And, you know, there's he goes and checks all the suspects. I remember it was really, really good. Not a comedy. It was just like a straight-up drama. And uh, so I I remember, you know, I remember liking it. And I think I mentioned it uh, a couple episodes ago. There's a, uh, this guy uh, has a brother. So there's there's another McDonough making movies. And his movies are more hit or miss for me. He's the guy that did uh, uh, Seven Psychopaths, which I Uh. do like. And he also did uh, Three Billboards Outside Evan, Missouri, which I liked. And, Eddie Strait's uh, favorite movie? Yes. <laughs> so that he is the one that's kind of a... You know, I remember watching Calvary and thinking, oh, I need to watch more from this guy. And I think at the time I knew that there was another movie, that The Guard was out there somewhere for me to watch. But then his brother made movies that caught my eye, and I kind of forgot about this other Madonna, I guess, until just now. <laughs> so watching, you know, The Guard, I was like, I couldn't even remember... After I was done with the movie, I looked up his filmography. I was like, oh, yeah, Calvary. That's I've seen that one. But I, I went into this one with very no expectations. And not because I expected it to be bad, but just as in, like, I don't know what the tone's going to be, what's, uh, you know, what kind of movie we're walking into. I was not, I was certainly not expecting, uh, you know, this, this sort of Guy Ritchie type of movie. And I don't want to, now that we're in real talk, like I'm not saying Guy Ritchie as in like, oh, this guy's just ripping off Guy Ritchie because that's not yeah. what's happening. But kind of uh, all these characters have very clever conversations that are a couple levels above the standard dialogue that you get in, in some of these movies. And so mm-hmm. that's what happens in Guy Ritchie movies. Like this, <laughs> these are some of the best examples. Yeah, and it happens here. Like I, I really like the, I mean, there's so many of them, but from the beginning, they're at the the first crime scene and they start talking about movies. Like the rookie is talking about how 
<laughs> there's a because they have the on the wall there's a five and a half spray yeah. painted and uh and so the rookie starts going well there's a movie called eight and a half <laughs> it's fellini <laughs> there's a movie called seven we call it seven <laughs> yeah <laughs> in that you know they engage in that conversation it's like a little bit of pop culture a little bit of a kind of I guess self awareness of what the tropes of the, of the genre. When we first meet uh, the bad guys, for some reason they're discussing, they're quoting philosophers, ancient philosophers, <laughs> which is not mm-hmm. what you would expect in this type of movie. But but at the same time, you would expect that for um, this type of movie if it was directed by Guy Ritchie. So I was not expecting it, and I was really happy once I figured out that that's what we're in for. I mean, you know, I I'm not. I don't have a whole lot of experience with Brendan Gleeson. You know, it's like Harry Potter movies, Calvary, The the Village. I'm sure I've seen it in a couple other things, but I don't know. This is probably now the most memorable performance of his that I've seen because he's just so, uh, I guess, so funny. He's just so, so good for this material. And, you know, the contrast with Don Cheadle is just perfect. He is really funny in this. Just everything's so dry and droll. It's uh, without coming across as like, too much or you know too on the nose type thing uh and then yeah don Cheadle. i mean a very versatile actor we joke about this a lot i do honestly feel like he's kind of underutilized yeah he's very uh i mean i think that don Cheadle is is an a-lister but absolutely he's he's utilized what i mean by underutilized is it feels like you watch stuff like this and there's more that can be got from him he can make movies like this, and it can be like really pulled off well. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not just you know the crushingly depressing shit that he has to do. <laughs> that it seems <laughs> to. <laughs> I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is I'd like to see him in more uh, action-driven movies, comedies, that type of thing. Uh, he's definitely his filmography covers the whole spectrum, but I feel. I don't know. I, I If I said something like I don't feel like he gets a, enough credit for being as versatile as he is, I feel like that would be like asinine because he's won so many awards. But it, you kind of know what I'm trying to say. Like He's a great actor, but I feel like he doesn't get enough credit for just what I said, how versatile he is. Yeah, I, I think that he's a no, – I mean, this is going to sound negative, but it's not meant to be. He's an A-lister, but he's not a movie star. You know, that's. Mm-hmm. I think that that's how I would put it because he's not uh, – up there with those with those guys that can open a movie which are you know there's less and less of them i think <laughs> you know yep men and women uh, traitor was the movie i was thinking about oh i don't know what that is it's him and guy pierce it's from 2008 it's like a spy thriller it's not fun <laughs> just bleak i never saw rain over me with him and adam sandler that also looks pretty brutal Mm-hmm. And, uh, Adam Sandler traumatized by 9-11, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, pass. Uh, I didn't realize he was in the, the Denzel movie Flight. Is he the cop in Swordfish? I think yes. I remember him chasing yeah. Hugh Jackman down a hill. Agent J.T. Roberts, yep. There you go. Don Cheadle can do it all. But, you know, you I don't think that anybody expects Don Cheadle to, to open a movie, you know, like to have a, a strong weekend. He's not uh, like... Brad Pitt or Julia Roberts or Sandra Bullock, you know, those, that caliber. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it feels like maybe he should be (laughs) because he's just so, like you said, so versatile. But I think that somehow he's found himself more in the the side of uh, prestige cinema and not so much blockbusters, even though he is, you know, he's a pretty big part part of the the MCU. MCU. Yep. Yeah. But, you know, I think he's proved that you can have it both ways. (laughs) I forgot he was in Boogie Nights, too. So, yeah, I enjoy the dynamic between Gleason and Don Cheadle in this. Now, I think, overall, you probably enjoyed the movie a bit more than I did, just based on you know our talking back and forth. I did find things I enjoyed about it, but overall, there were parts of this that kind of really dragged for me. The mom? Yeah, the, the side story going with his mom, I'm not opposed to something like that, but it felt kind of... It felt forced, yet at the same time, like... Um, truncated you know it's like we have to have this in here but we can't expand upon it too much and 
I felt like there could have been more interesting aspects to that, but it felt like we're kind of just dropped in and it's like, well, his mom's about to die and that's all we really know. And so we're just going to see these brief interactions between them until she does die. And yeah, it works in the sense of uh, making viewers empathetic towards the Boyle character. But uh, to me, every time it came across, it just felt, it felt like I was watching like a storytelling machination instead of just letting a movie happen to me and that type of thing. So, the 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 acting's still good. It's not like those scenes were a slog, but it just felt unnecessary is not the right word. It just didn't work for me. And even though the runtime's an hour and a half, when the movie ended, I was like, okay, yeah, that that needed to wrap it up pretty quick. Which is weird because it's a movie that's so quick mm-hmm. and uh, light on its feet. But once you get past the good dialogue and some of the admittedly really funny stuff uh, is like you know his infatuation with hookers and stuff like that. It <laughs> It's a very, very paint by numbers cop movie, and there's really no new added twist to it. Uh, the story itself, like I said, the surroundings of it, the dialogue's good, but at its core, it's a very predictable, very elementary police thriller. It felt kind of like a tribute to the the Lethal Weapons and like the cop, you know, the action cop movies of the '80s, but but then still tried to be its own thing, but didn't really do enough of modernizing the story. And yeah, it just, it overall didn't work for me. Do you think that this movie works better for an Irish audience that can't just truly see themselves in, you know, in the guard? In yeah. Yeah. His absolutely. Surroundings? I wonder, you know, um, cause I hadn't really thought about it until now. The movie worked. It definitely worked better for me than it did for you. Uh, I think that I I really connected with the, the humor. I, I or really appreciated the humor in a way that, to me, that's why I watched the movie. I watched, you know, when it was all over, I'm like, okay. It was, yes, it didn't reinvent the wheel, but it was extremely entertaining because of the of the dialogue and, the, you know, it had a, a couple of, like, really, the fuck yeah moments, you know, him pulling the gun out of his crotch. <laughs> that was... <laughs> that was good and uh it was really good yeah i i liked how irreverent it was uh, about it all and uh and i think now that we're in real talk well it was clear to me that i was being manipulated by the the scenes with the mom <laughs> i didn't mm-hmm. mind it because it was a nice break from the just the, the smart ass tone of the rest of the movie and I think that that's, that's something that sometimes, because I was thinking, you know, this this type of movie can also get on my nerves. And it can get on my nerves hard uh, when when there's just characters that are just mouthpieces for clever dialogue, and and not much more than that. You know, it's mm-hmm. like sometimes I watch movies and I'm like, okay, this was just clearly some guy who really likes. Tarantino, Kevin Smith, uh, you know, all these screenwriters that are known for just having characters <laughs> digress into conversations about pop culture. And uh, so now this guy, you know, sometimes you see filmmakers that want to do the same thing. Uh, they don't have the story. They don't have the characters, but they have the dialogue and they just have characters come in and talk and have conversations. And it just feels, you know, fake. And, and this could be that if it didn't have those brief moments where it slows down and actually has characters connecting. So the, I think that the mom subplot is like a big thing that did it for me. And then also the connection he had with uh, his partner's widow. And, mm-hmm. you know, when it just kind of slows down and there's no quips, there's no smart ass references. It's just him being, you know, a human being and trying to be supportive. But now I'm like all that hadn't even crossed my mind that this movie, maybe it wasn't even made for an American audience specifically, <laughs> you know, which is, you know, it was made for an Irish audience. And then we just benefit, you know, we because <laughs> we get it as well. But, you know, this is an Irish filmmaker, I'm assuming. So this is the equivalent of, uh, you know, in my mind, like a Peruvian filmmaker making a really awesome Peruvian cop movie mm-hmm. <laughs> that's like really witty. Yeah, somebody from America goes like, oh, yeah, I've seen this before. It, this is good, but I've seen it before. And then somebody in Peru is like, oh, my God, <laughs> they did it. I know we had a, yeah, yeah. I think we had a similar conversation about a movie somewhat recently where I was trying to to put myself in that position where I'm like, okay, well, if this was 
you know, a movie made in a different country, you'd probably give it a little, cut a little more slack. Anyway, I, I, this is the third time or fourth time in this episode that I'm going to ask if we have any Irish listeners. Tell me, how do you feel about the, about the guard? And did it feel like they resonate more strongly with you because it's set in your country and it's about somebody that's your nationality? You know, and do you see the <laughs> the Don Cheadle character as this uptight, joyless uh, <laughs> American? I did appreciate that his character wasn't obsessed with guns because that seems to be the modern. And not that we don't deserve that awful reputation, but that seems mm-hmm. to be everyone's go-to. Yeah, and I would imagine, too, the natives would appreciate that this kind of stuck to it as opposed to, you know, the Guy Ritchie's that we mentioned who definitely turn things up to 11 uh, and really lean into a lot of not stereotyping, but celebrating the more loud and excessive aspects of culture. Whereas in here, it was just kind of at no point in this that I think I was watching like an exaggeration necessarily of uh, how some people in an Irish pub might talk to each other. Yeah. And yeah. I, I don't know. Also full disclosure. I just, it, it's been a rough week. I've been tired too. So I already did make like a mental note to, I'm going to give this movie another shot at some point in time. Cause I did not dislike it. I just found myself kind of, um, it moved a bit too slow for me, but Brennan Gleason is fantastic in the lead. And, uh, we already obviously talked about Don Cheadle, Mark strong. He could be the hired gun for the bad guys in every action movie until he's fucking 70 (laughs) and I'd be fine with it. Yeah. Hopefully he would be fine with that too. (laughs) He is in a, you know, I gotta feel bad because I've forgotten that he was in green lantern. He's in another DC movie. This one did much better, but, uh, he was the bad guy in, uh, Shazam a couple of years ago. He's Mark Strong. He, How was he does that? what he has to do. I, I felt it was too long. It, it's all right. I mean, I it was one of the things where uh, it's happened with a couple of those DC movies where I watch it. I'm like, that was, I had a good time. But then the next day, I'm like, I would never watch that again. <laughs> it was one and done. The moment's come and gone. Yeah. But I can still look back and appreciate Mark Strong is good. You know, I, I don't think I've seen him be bad in anything. Uh, and he's doing the Mark Strong thing where he's just intimidating. You know, he looks sinister. Um, there's a movie where he's not a bad guy. In a, well, he's not a bad guy in Kingsman. Uh, but it's also he's not a bad guy in uh, Rock and Roller. Have you seen that one? That's a Guy Ritchie movie also. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah, he's yeah. he's a, the mentor there. He's not a bad guy. I remember liking him there. So he, he's got a future, this, this Mark Strong guy. He just might make it yet. Uh, yeah. I did not catch this. Boyle says in the movie, the FBI lad probably hadn't had this much fun since they burned up all those kids in Waco. Yes. Jesus. <laughs> so he's clearly trying to push a button, right? <laughs> I mean. Yeah. It's not like he, he wrote that joke thinking, ah, it's just funny. You know, he wrote that joke you know, knowing that 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 would just stir things up, like I don't care, but it, <laughs> but it's I can see some people taking offense. That the Polanski one are good lines too, because like especially that Waco one, it's not the lowest hanging fruit, mm-hmm. and and it's one of those things of like there's no you can't come back from that of like yeah <laughs> that shit happened and it was fucking awful. <laughs> it's not like it's not like a matter of opinion. I think what we did in the Waco siege was bad. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah, and actually, I think that it's, uh, you know, there is a uh, very, no, I'm not going to call it subtle, but just kind of like a low-key uh, constant criticism, I guess, of, of America. But it also counterbalanced mm-hmm. with uh, acknowledging, I guess, some good things about America. Like, you know, again, Don Cheadle is the only American in this movie. And so he... Uh, he shows up, but he's very uptight. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't seem to have a sense of humor about any of this. But he also, I mean, there is a line, and we mentioned it in Contrarian's Corner, where they, the bad guys go like, no, he can't be bought. We're not even going to try that. Which is, yes, it's it's ridiculous on the face of just everything else. But at the same time, it, it feels like 
you know, if this is an Irish filmmaker <laughs> doing that, is it, I think it kind of leans into the, I guess, stereotype of Americans being, you know, the the super cops, the world cops or whatever. It's, it's just... Yeah, the world police. Yeah, the world police. And it's like, oh, no, you know, we can, we can bribe our own cops, but no, we're not going to bribe an American cop. But then at the same time, you know, he's calling out shit like the, the Waco incident. And, you know, there's just like this constant, the, the way that uh, Gleason's character is constantly like poking at Don Cheadle, you know, just kind of like fucking with him. I, I'm sure that some people could read it as an Irish filmmaker just poking at American culture, uh, the good and mm-hmm. the bad of it. And so that's that's pretty cool, uh, you know, and it's not a big statement. I mean, this is just like a 90 minute comedy that actually finds some time to just take those jabs and then keep going with his story. Have you ever seen it in Bruges? Yes. Is that Gleason? Yeah, he's the the older mm-hmm. criminal. Right? He's there with uh Colin Farrell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've never seen it. That's that's a good movie. Uh In Bruges was actually by Martin McDonough, the brother of no, John Michael. There you go. I think one of them is a playwright. Maybe they're both playwrights. But uh Martin I mean of course he's made more movies, I guess, so that's why more split yeah, I like In Bruges, Seven Psychopaths. It's seven seven psychopaths is like what I was saying. It just feels like he just wanted people to talk, you know, have cool dialogue, and the the story's not really there. I remember really disliking that movie. Yeah, I remember when that came out, I was kind of excited about it. You were one of the first people I talked to, and you were like, sucked. I was like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> all right. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> action sequence that closed that I actually got really into, Don Cheadle with his assault rifle, and just because it was pretty simple, and it was... Um, to me, it was well shot, and the the audio that was really good there because there wasn't any like uh, there might have been some like subtle score, but the real I always love big shootouts like that in movies where the the emphasis is on like the gunshots and the violence as opposed mm-hmm. to you know big crescendoing music or something. Um, so I really enjoyed the the closing of it and the Dark Knight Rises ending. That's <laughs> I thought it was pretty clear that he survived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love uh, the the happy ending on its side of, well, maybe not, but yeah, it, it, to me, the tone of the movie is it's pretty clear. And uh, the idea of him being like a swimmer and Don Cheadle not sure if he can believe that or not, it's, it adds an element of fun to a pretty morose, be the word I'm looking to describe the, the ending there. Because yeah, it is. It's a bunch of fucking death and... <laughs> <laughs> Our main character may have died. So yeah, I mean, if it, can you imagine if the if the movie ends with him dying, then it's just too much of a downer. That's not what we want. Oh yeah, it would completely betray the tone it's set to. Mm-hmm. I do think that it's not like he has much of an arc, which might be one of the reasons why it doesn't. It it feels a little more slight than it really is, mm-hmm. um, because. Uh, now that we're in real talk, I mean, yeah, he has, he's not like a perfect cop, but it's like you no. said, I mean, he still cares about his job enough that, you know, he he tries to do it well. It seems like he tries to do it well. So it's not like this was a guy that had completely checked out and then through the events of the movie, he he becomes someone who decides to take a stand against these criminals. This is just... I, I think he's still the same person at the end of the movie that he was at the beginning of the movie. And that's fine. I mean, obviously the movie works and it's entertaining and everything. But I guess if anything, the person that maybe changes here is Don Cheadle. Because, yeah, he does seem to appreciate Gleason. There's more ways to do it than just buy the books is his takeaway from it. Ah, there you go. That's a, that's a good summation. <laughs> Sometimes you got to just... Be crazy. You you can't wait for backup. You just have to go in. <laughs> you don't <laughs> like got to break the rules, but you can bend them a little bit. You know, it works yeah. out. Just got to be confident. <laughs> yeah, you got to make sure. Or, you know, just um, submit to the fact that you're you're probably going to die. As long as, you know, <laughs> even then, you know, death. yeah, you're still confident in the outcome of what's going to happen. So it works out either way. So, Julio, with all that being said, what are you giving this? Where does it fall on your scale? Um, I'm landing on four stars. I think that it's a, it's a solid, fun movie. Really funny. The dialogue is really what you know 
takes it over the top. I mean, it, obviously, it's a combination, right? The, the dialogue would do nothing if you didn't have the actors to, to pull it off. And the actors wouldn't be able to do anything if you didn't have that dialogue for them to build off of. So, But that's really, the conversations is really what I'm going to remember the most about uh, the guard and just how funny they are. And then a close second, the, the really awesome moment where uh, Brendan Gleeson pulls a tiny gun from his from scratch and shoots the guy (laughs) just amazing yeah that was tremendous yeah four stars for me uh how about you i I found myself on a c plus uh and again the caveat being that i'm more than open to watching this again could just be you know it, it hasn't really happened as often here on the podcast but i know it we've talked about this in real life. You know, sometimes if your mood is a bit askew when you watch something, especially when you're taking notes and trying to be bitchy, it can, it can (laughs) affect your judgment. So I might have to fire this one up when I'm cleaning, uh, or just have it on as a background noise at some point just to take it in again. But, uh, definitely a movie I would recommend people seeing. It's still, you know, my thoughts of it dragging doesn't change the fact that it's 90 minutes long. So, uh, tried and true in the maddest rule sense and um, some good laughs, some good action, some great acting. So C is not a bad thing and the C plus is not a bad thing in this case. So there you go. KT and OT, let us know how you're feeling about how we're feeling. If we call out anything that you disagree with, be sure to fire it our way. Whatever the case, as I say, every time we do this every month, when our patrons bring something new and you know uncharted territory into our you know film zeitgeist, it's much appreciated. Just getting to watch something new, so thank you for that, Julio. That satisfies this month's patron demand on our main feed. So, yes, what comes next as far uh, as what can Contrarians fans expect on the main feed? Up next is the the final stop in the Muppethon. It's it's all been building up to this. The last, as in the most recent, theatrical outing for the Muppets. Muppets Most Wanted. Tremendous. Uh, most infamously known as a, a movie that was not received as well as the Muppets from 2011. <laughs> to be fair, none of their movies have been. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you got <laughs> Tina Fey... You got Ty Burrell, Ray you Liotta. Got Ray Liotta. You get a Lady Gaga cameo in this one. It's underrated, and yes. I, I'm looking forward to making my case for why that is. All right, well that's that's next. And also, if you want to hear me talk about a somewhat obscure uh, Chuck Norris movie from the '80s, which I know what you're thinking, uh, that does not sound like the kind of thing I would watch. You're right, I wouldn't. Except our friends from Pinto Comics hit me up and they asked me if I wanted to be on the show and that was the movie that they were going to discuss so I had to watch it. Regardless of how I felt about the movie uh, by the time I was done with it and you'll find out if you listen to the episode, it was a good conversation. So that was really, (laughs) that's really what I want to focus on. That's the positive. Uh, So just check out uh, Pine of Comics. The movie is called The Octagon and uh, it was me, (laughs) John and Joe talking about it and uh, having a good time. I never watched a Chuck Norris movie beginning to end, and uh, I probably never will again. <laughs> that's that's it as far as uh, what the future holds, the immediate future. Get us out of here, Alex. All right, let's take it into perennial plugs. We start off by giving a thanks to the festive years who provide our opening and closing tracks. They kick us off with Last Stand, take us home with Summer of 99. Be sure to head over to thefestiveyears.com for any and all festive years needs. Our friend and fellow podcaster Hans Rothieser, he's the man behind our logo, behind all the graphics on our webpage, on our Patreon page, on our merch page. Uh, he is a great artist. He's also a great podcaster. He has two podcasts, Nacion Combi, which is about Peruvian current affairs, and Marginal, which is about economy. And he's also a novelist. Uh, you can check all his work out at his website, mildemonios.pe that's m-i-l-d-e-m-o-n-i-o-s dot p-e or you can reach out to him on twitter at mildemonios or email him mildemonios at hotmail.com Hans thank you for all your support and lastly we give thanks to Miss Zoe Perez who helps curate our social media game if you haven't already and you're on Facebook facebook.com slash contrarian prime 
there you'll see some exclusive videos and content as it regards to upcoming episodes and Zoe helps put together those videos that are posted on Instagram at Contrarian Prime be sure to give us a follow there you'll see audio clips interactive graphics sometimes some video clips as well uh, Zoe helps just make all that shit look really pretty far more so than Julio and I could do so Zoe we greatly appreciate the work that you do for us and with those pleasantries out of the way, that is going to conclude this episode of The Contrarians, where we're right and you're wrong, and we will catch you next time. This is where we let our patrons know what... Fuck. <laughs> Sorry.